Uh, when, I, when I recently was in uh, Wenzhou, China, talking to what I call the Pope of a house church network there, um, it's a group that I've, ta I've taught with over the last decade or so in a little Bible school that they have, a little clandestine Bible school. He came to me and said, I've got a big problem. I said, what's that? He, um, all my people are moving to the city, and because they're moving to the city, the pastors are going with them. And because the pastors are going with them to the city, they need more education than they've had. So I said, that's, that's good. And um, he sa I said, well, how many do you have to train a year? And his answer to me was 10,000 a year. Okay. And he said, if I do that for 10 years, then I'll have enough ready to meet the need that we have in our house church network. So 10,000 for 10 years is what, is what his goal was. And so uh, he said, what do you think I ought to do? And I said, I don't know exactly what you ought to do, but I can tell you this, I can tell you what not to do. Don't do what we did in the West, because we know the results of that. Now, he was in shock, of course, because anybody that says, don't do it like the West does it, um, you know, nobody does that. Everybody knows to do it is the best way. And um, so he was surprised that I said that, but as we started walking through the items and talking about it, it became uh, clear to him, and it was clear to me, I think already, I'm already committed to this, that the way we have done theological education in the West is not suited for the future of the church. And in fact, we have to wonder really whether, how, what, how well it's done for the church even in the past, okay? So there are, in my opinion, two main issues that we need to think about when it comes to global theological education in the present and in the near future. And the first of those is the scarcity of theological education. Let's, shall we call it, uh, when I say theological education, I mean basically church leadership development, okay? So we'll, we'll use those term, terms interchangeably. But the scarcity of it, that's number one, and the second would be the quality of it. So let's talk scarcity first. This is a um, uh, the chart that I want to show you here from the Atlas uh, from the Atlas of Global. I thought you were telling me to look at something. <laughs> Richard, look over there. Atlas of Global Christianity. And I don't know if you know this book. I'm, if you're involved in the missions um, department here, then you probably do know this book. And um, basically, you know, there are lots of people out there who make a living off of, S, of um, predicting what the Holy Spirit is going to do. And that's what this book does. It does it on the basis of scientific, demographic studies, and those sorts of things. But basically, if, um, if Holy Spirit does what he has been doing the last 25 years or so, for the next 25 years or so, then this is the way things are going to fall out. This is more or less, the Atlas of Global Christianity is more or less the, global, the golden standard for um, theological um, matters of this sort, um, predicting what's happening in the church, where the growth of Christianity will be. Now, these numbers that you see up here are every brand of Christianity you can possibly imagine, okay? These are people who would just check the box, I'm a Christian. So it includes every denomination, every variety, every cult that would name itself such. But anyway, but basically the numbers run like this. Uh, the green represents the numbers around 2010, the blue 2050. And you can see that across the board, this is going to be, they predict a slight increase at least everywhere in the world. But the numbers to the right, the, for example, North America at seven, negative 7% 7 growth is by, by comparison to the general population growth. So the growth of North America, Canada, Mexico, Canada, and the United States, would, we're going to have an increase in the number of Christians in this part of the world, but by comparison to the general population, we're going to drop at least to 7%. It would be worse than that. In the United States of America, it would be much worse than that if it weren't for the Latinos. Okay, the immigration of Latinos to the United States is um, causing the numbers to bump up. And that's a good thing, positive, but when we talk about the theological development of Latino church leaders, it's not so positive because they're hay nada. Okay, there is none. And that's a big problem. Oceania, who cares? We don't even know where that is. Okay. Europe, negative 3.4%, we already know that, and it would be worse than that if it were for immigration from Africa, because the growth of the church in, Af in uh, Europe is basically African growth, immigrant growth. 
South American, negative 2.3%. And again, that's in large part because they're having lots of babies down there. The church will grow, and there is revival in South America, and they expect it to continue, at least for there to be residuals from it. But um, this, again, is by virtue of the comparison to the general population growth, a negative 2.3%. Asia, um, at this point, the people who do these studies um, are predicting that um, growth in China especially has already flattened out. And um, when you talk to people in China, they will anecdotally tell you that's true also, that the massive growth we saw in the past is now beginning to decline and flatten out, the S-curve flat, flattening out, beginning to turn downward, in large part because of the prosperity, okay, and the lack of persecution. Because as you know, it's counterintuitive as it is, when the church is persecuted, the church grows. And when the church is not persecuted, it doesn't. Um, exhibit A, the United States of America, okay? Um, of course, the number one place of church growth in the future is going to be Africa. And already, by 2010, there was an estimated 500 million Christians in Africa. And the estimate of the Atlas is that there are going to be another 500 million Christians in Africa by 2050, so a billion of them. Now, I think anybody who's aware at all of the um, situation of theological education vis-a-vis -vis these kinds of numbers realizes that currently you can basically take this chart and flip it upside down and you would have where the bulk of theological institutions are. Okay? They are in North America where there is going to be negative growth. They are in Europe so on and so on, okay? So the reality is already we are way behind the curve in meeting the need for theological education, church leadership development in places like Africa, Asia, especially those two places, somewhat in South America. We're certainly not behind the curve here in this country except for certain ethnic groups and socioeconomic groups. We are in dire need for people other than people like you and me to have opportunity for theological education in this country, but good luck on that. Okay, at any rate, that's where we are, okay? But if that's the case now, it's going to be even worse in the next 35 years. Because if you're going to add another 500 million Christians in Africa, another 500 million, and if we were going to have one pastor for every 100 of those, how many pastors would we have to have trained by 2050? Can somebody tell me? Can somebody do the numbers? 500 million, you need one for every 100 of them. So how many pastors do we need? Five million. Five million by 2050. So the prospects of the scarcity of theological education being lessened in this world in the next 35 years is not very high. It's going to get worse unless we do something radical. If we continue to think of places like Africa as a place where you establish a Bible school or two with 25 to 50, maybe a huge one of 100 people in it, and we do this step by step by step, we feel like we're doing God a favor if we do one a year or something like that as a local church, um, if you realize it's simply not going to happen. If you think even of China today, the numbers you just heard the two of us give you, those numbers will continue to be like that. They don't have opportunity. They have to create Bible schools that have 25 and 30 so they can hide somewhere in some apartment. And you just simply physically cannot make enough schools to meet the need. It is just as simple as that. You would have to have an Elijah um, and the Shulamite, Shulamite widow miracle for that to happen. You with me on this? Okay, so what we're looking at today is dire. What we're looking at in the next 35 years or so is even worse. Now, I had the opportunity to speak to the deans of every evangelical seminary, ATS seminary in America recently, and I asked them this question toward the end of the talk. Um, I said to them, I said, I know the answer from my branch of the church. I'm Presbyterian, PCA, so you know, I know the answer from my tradition. Um, but what about the rest of you? And there was about 60 schools represented there, including yours. I said, um, 
How many of you have a program in Spanish? What would you guess was the answer? About 60 schools. All the deans were there. What would you guess would be a reasonable response? Mind you, this includes places like Dallas, San Diego, where the majority language is Spanish, okay? Majority legal language is Spanish. So how many would you say there were? Can you guess? Mission pastor says zero. All right, mission pastor over there says zero. The answer is none, <laughs> zero, zero. And I looked at them and I said, guys, I don't know how we figured out how to do this, but we white evangelicals in America have figured out how to be in the coffin and nailing it shut at the same time. Because that's what that is. Ignoring the only growing dimension of the church, not training their leaders is, is not just uh, ridiculous, it is suicidal. So if you're looking for a mission in life, there it is. If you're looking to do something more than become just an ordinary local church pastor and um, you know, secure your retirement and those kinds of things, there it is. You don't even have to leave this country. All you have to do is learn some Spanish. But then I asked this group, same group, I said, um, <coughs> does anyone want a program in Spanish? Okay. Out of the whole group, one group raised his hand in San Diego, Grace Theological Seminary, raised his hand, and he said, I said, well, then why don't you have one? He said, well, here's the problem. You have to have three or four professors that speak Spanish fluently. Where are they? And then he said, we have to have 40 or so students who are willing to pay $15,000 a year in tuition to support those professors. Where are they? And I said, well, if that's your model, it'll never be done. So what we're saying about Africa, what we're saying about Asia, is the same here. If you continue to do it the same way, it will never be done. Capiche? Okay, so uh, thus Third Millennium Ministries, okay? Um, third Millennium Ministries is a ministry, I, I used to teach Old Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, Florida. I taught some of your professors here, and um, you know, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Um, but in doing that, I made the big mistake as a seminary professor, and that was, the first one was in 1985 when my wife and I went to Poland to do street evangelism with Campus Crusade, back when communists were still communists and Christians were still Christians over there. And then the bit, next big mistake we made was we went back again and again and again. And when the Berlin Wall fell and the communism disintegrated, the Soviet Union broke apart, they started asking me to come to teach rather than to do street evangelism. And so I did, but I became very aware of this reality as my wife and I traveled around a lot teaching. Uh, the reality is, you know, seminary professors don't work very hard. Sorry, I'm gonna let the secret out, okay? We don't work very hard. You know the best part of teaching in seminary, don't you? Summer. And the next best part is fall break, and next best is spring break. The next is when you get some seniority, you get January off. So you have all of December. You have, I'm sorry. You have all of December and all of January off. So you're not you're working about seven and a half months a year as a professor, okay? And so I got to travel a lot to teach around the world and thought that I would be able to recruit other professors to do the same, and they do. I mean, there are many that do this. Um, and they'll go to places like Paris, okay? but they're not going to go to Ulaanbaatar but one time, okay? They'll go to Kampala maybe a couple of times if they're really into it. But once they get sick, they get food poisoning one time, I'm not going back to that place, I nearly died last year, okay? So there's a problem. And as a result of that, third millennium by a number of different processes um, developed. One of those processes was a student at Reformed Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, a woman student, um, who um, was sitting at the table one day and an African international student came by and said, can I look at that magazine? It was a Time magazine. And he picked it up and looked at it and she says her, his eyes got as big as saucers and he said, I think that's my son on the front, of, the front cover of Time magazine. And it was a picture, when she took it from him, it was a picture of a pile of teenage Africans that had been killed and thrown into a ditch. Well, two days later, they called the Red Cross. They found out two days later it was his son, at which time she decided no more of this. 
No more bringing pastors from Africa one at a time to a theological school here. 92% of them don't go back, by the way, for more than five years. 92% don't go back for more than five years. Bring them here, separating them from their families, from their churches, so that things like that happen. And so she decided it was time to put seminary in a box and get it to them. And eventually, uh, this is a plantation matriarch in the Delta of Mississippi, okay, you know, 9,000 kids and 44,000 grandchildren, that kind, of, that kind of setup. And so eventually she came to me and said, hey, if I get the money, can you get the box? And I said, yeah, I can get the box. If you can get the money, I can get the box. And that's the way Third Mill got going. And uh, so Third Millennium has as its goal, threefold tagline, Biblical, educa biblical education, and by that we mean um, what you would get in a, basically in an MA program at a school like this, MA in Biblical Studies, a two-year degree. Biblical education, uh, by the way, that thing is, that, that program that we make is a multimedia program. I'm going to describe it to you in a moment. Uh, biblical education, then second tagline is for the world, for the world, and we actually mean that. I mean, I know it sounds grandiose, but we believe that every Christian in the world has a right to a well-taught pastor. And that there's only one reason why they don't. There really is only one reason why. And that is that we hoard it here. You didn't want to feel comfortable, did you? Okay, I won't let you feel comfortable on this one because I've seen it with my own eyes like you have. We hoard it here, making our buildings nicer and our seats softer and our air conditioners work better. And meanwhile, the vast majority of Christians in the world today, the vast majority, according to Ralph Winters, and this was 20 years ago, the vast majority of Christians in the world today are being led by pastors who have had less than one hour of training in the Bible. You think about that. And you think about how much you've seen pastors in this country abuse their people. Imagine what they would have done if they had had less than an hour of training in the Bible. It is a nightmare out there for your brothers and sisters. It is a nightmare out there for your brothers and sisters. I wish I could tell you that it was just that they didn't believe in predestination or they didn't understand the Trinity or something weird like that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about Christians being encouraged to enslave their children in brick factories in India. I've seen it with my own eyes by their own pastors. I've seen children who are left to live lives with twisted legs because the pastors have told their elders that, and, their, and their, that girl's father, that she is paying for the sins of her family, that her family has bad karma, and if they heal her legs at the hospital, then the karma won't leave her family. Those are the kinds of stories I can tell you in mixed company. We're still in Alabama. I can't speak certain things in mixed company. All right, Mark? Okay. Those are the nice stories of the abuses that pastors put on their children and on their parishioners in China, in India, in Africa. And it happens over and over and over and over again. Now, I'm sure a lot of that's just because they're sinners like we are, okay? But a lot of what happens out there is just because they just don't know any better. So, third millennium is committed to bringing biblical education to the whole world. That means every land, every language. And we won't stop until we're either dead or that happens. Biblical education for the world, and the last tagline is for free. You know the Bible verse, freely you receive, so charge them as much as possible. You remember that one? It's in the Greek. Didn't they show you that variant? No, freely you receive, freely give. And as far as I'm concerned, with all the privileges that I had, even though I paid for my education, with all the privileges I had, it was given to me. And for that reason, I'm devoting my life to giving it to them. Okay, so if you're going to reach the whole world with that kind of theological base, um, you're going to have to believe in certain things, in my opinion. The first thing I need to say is sort of a caveat at this point, and that is we do not believe you should try to replace human teachers. Human teachers are very important. We do believe, however, that human teachers out there need to be facilitated and they need to be helped because typically what happens in, in, in around the world and even in this country, when people deal with the underprivileged and the underserved, typically what happens is those who teach are overwhelmed by the responsibility and they need help. And so we do believe that human learning communities are very important 
but we also believe they can be facilitated so they can be more effective and they can be multiplied more rapidly. In order to do that, however, you have to create a curriculum that has certain characteristics. And one of those characteristics, we would say, is that it has to be able to be delivered by every level of, at every level of technology you can possibly imagine. Because one, the world has different levels of technology in it currently, and technology is always changing. So as far as Third Mill is concerned, you ought to be able to deliver a curriculum on paper if that's all they have. And so when you get to the point that you're starting to develop a global seminary, which I hope you will because there's plenty of room, won't be any threat to us, no competition to us, it's a big world out there, you need to be thinking about how you're going to create this curriculum from the ground up. There are places in the world where Third Mill is used, like South Sudan, on paper only. It's the only thing they have, so it's like an old-fashioned correspondence course with a book and fill-in-the-blank kind of thing. You with me on this? Uh, the next level up is audio only. You know, that's for radio, that's for MP3 players, and, and these little, um, uh, these little um, what's it called? What's that item called, the video, this, the solar video piece? Mega yeah, Mega Voice, yeah. It's a solar video, pardon me, the solar audio player, okay, that's all around with Bible on it. Now it's being loaded up with third mill curriculum. You get the whole curriculum on paper, the whole curriculum in audio only, but the better way to get it is with video. But every form of video you can imagine, hard drives, DVDs, thumb drives. We just delivered about five to 8,000 thumb drives with a whole year of curriculum, seminary curriculum on it, into Nigeria. And it cost for each one of those thumb drives $16 a piece. A year of theological education in a seminary like this one. $16 a piece. Did you hear that? That's why it's free. Um, you also have to be able to deliver this online. Third Mill does have, on, is online. You can take a look at our website at some point. Every mobile device. You know, this is where education is going. Everybody knows this is the case by now. And that is education is going to be done. What virtual dimensions of education are going to be done are going to be done on mobile devices. So Third Mill has apps for every mobile device you can possibly imagine. In fact, in Cuba, we are used now with about 500 students, pastors, active pastors who are now in schools. Um, we are um, used by, on uh, video tablets that a young man in Memphis buys, loads up with SD cards, and takes down to Cuba. So they get these little $60 video tablets, and that's their main resource for getting their lecture material. And then they, they meet together in their learning communities to use those videos that they've studied on their own. Does that make sense? Um, people are now buying I, old iPhones. If you want to give me your old iPhone, I'll take it. And they are loading third mill curriculum onto it to take into China. You can do this because you can put it on a SIM card. We started off saying seminary in a box. Now you can say seminary in, on a SIM. Okay, or seminary on an SD card. Seminary on a video tablet. Seminary in your back pocket. One day, seminary on a chip that you put in your wrist. You know, the whole Logos database on a chip that's stuck into your arm. You like that day? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you have to learn Hebrew? <laughs> Next level up for us would be a CMS, a content management system. We do use Moodle. We have, the, we have in my opinion, and I've looked around, the sexiest Moodle site there is. Take a look at it sometime. Go to the Third Mill website and then go over and look, find our CMS, our Moodle system. If you know Moodle, it usually looks crummy, okay, but we've made it look really good. And um, so um, that's, and looking good is very important because that's part of what you're trying to make happen here. And you, remember, you're dealing with people who are 25 years old and younger, and they're not going to look at junk. The last thing they want to look at is an old fat white man talking to them, like me. Okay, because there's nothing more boring than a professor. We know that, except a professor on video. Except a professor on video translated into another language. So what we make is truly multimedia and managed in a learning management system. And the highest level of technology for us is satellite television transmission. And we are broadcast in English, Russian, Spanish, Mandarin, and Arabic on a variety of various um, satellite networks. I mean, we're broadcast into places like Saudi Arabia. We're in Mecca. They're being used in learning communities in Saudi Arabia, immigrant learning communities, Yemen, you name it, we're there. We know this because they contact us by email, 
asking for more materials, asking for various study guides, things like that, because they watch us on Sat 7. It's kind of cool. Okay? Um, that's one thing you have to do if you're going to do this. You have to design a curriculum that will be able to be deliverable at every level of technology. You also have to design a curriculum that can be easily translated because it needs to be multiple ling multilingual. can't just be English. English is the lingua franca of the world today. It won't be for long, probably. But, you know, we run World War II, so we get to be the bosses when it comes to language, okay? And um, I don't know who's going to win World War III, but when we find out, then they'll be the ones that establish what language the world's going to speak. But as broad as English is, it's not good enough, especially for a place like Africa. For Africa, you need at least English, French, and Swahili, at least, to make a cut into Africa. But we are translated into those three languages, as well as Amharic for Ethiopia and um, uh, Kenya Rwandan for Rwanda, and now, now just most recently, we've begun to be translated into Swahili. So we're very excited about that. So it's cool and it's good, but it's got to be multilingual, which means it's got to be well prepared. It's got to be written in a way that can be translated easily, and you've got to create the systems for the translation. And let me suggest this to you: you need to do that simultaneously with English, not wait until you get the whole English thing done and then think about maybe putting it into Russian. Multilingual. Our five main languages in our office are English, Russian, Spanish, Latin American Spanish, Mandarin, and Modern Standard Arabic. We sound like Al Jazeera. That's our goal, anyway. And people say that. Yeah, sound like Al Jazeera. It's like great. That means we're doing our job. Um, and um, those five languages, according to the UN, cover 42 percent of the earth. The next, uh, there are other ministries that translate us into about 25 other languages, but they're outside of our office. And those other 25 cover about 20% of the earth. So you can see how, it, how it's rolling here and, and how important it is to keep on moving into these other languages. But the material that you make, in my opinion, if you're going to bring biblical education to the world, the whole world for free, also this curriculum has to be multicultural, which means it has to represent various ethnicities. It means you have to represent different parts of the world and so on and so on. This is just a sample of the various kinds of people that do teach with us. Um, these people are inserted into our program in a variety of ways at different times, and um, I'll get back to that slide in just a moment. And um, as they do that, then, what you discover is people are actually able to accept it more readily because it's their folk doing it. Now, Third Mill has designed its curriculum to look a lot like a History Channel documentary where you'll have expert interviews, but the main bulk of the lesson is multimedia. It's, it's animations, 3D animations, graphics of maps, charts, those kinds of um, um, dramatizations, things like that. And that minimizes how much you have to have a person on the screen, okay? How much lip syncing you have to do, all those kinds of things. But I can just give you a great example of this. Sat7, for example. Um, ask us to get rid of all the Western faces. For some reason, even after all we've done in the Middle East over the last 15 years, all the gifts we've given to them, they still don't want to look at white Western Christians on their satellites, okay? And so, uh, so we got rid of all the Westerners. So when you look at an Arabic program of Third Mill, it's Middle Easterners only. Does that make sense? Um, what East, East Africans have asked us, can you get rid of the white faces? Can they be black African faces? And our answer is yes. That's an easy thing for us to do. Because if you design the curriculum so you have the expert witnesses coming in, you just dump the ones you don't want and you put the ones in that you do want. And when you have schools, and schools are terribly threatened by all this, I can just tell you that I've been called the Antichrist more than you can possibly imagine, okay? But schools will buy into it more readily if you can look at them in the eye and say, we can get rid of teachers from every other school except yours. And they can be the interviewees. So you go down to, say, a San Pablo Seminario in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico, and you can, um, you can say to them, we can put your professors on Mexican television. You think they want that? You better believe they want it. But see, that's what you've got to be ready to do if you're going to develop this for the world for free. Um, um, a, another, another characteristic of our curriculum is that it's multi-denominational, a lot like your school here. Um, I am PCA, I'm Presbyterian, but the fact is, is that we have to work very hard to create a curriculum 
that centers on the important things and does not center on unimportant things or secondary things. For a third mill, basically, if you believe in the Apostles' Creed and you have a very high view of Scripture, you can work with us. It's not that hard. If you're on the edge of some weird or radical form of, say, maybe dispensationalism or something like that, I mean, really out there, you're going to be uncomfortable with our stuff. But it is definitely centrist evangelical. And more than that, we're committed that whenever there have been long-standing differences among various denominations, among evangelicals, then we have those denominations represent their views on the screen. None of this a Presbyterian talking about a Baptist or a Baptist talking about a Presbyterian because we always caricature the other side. So we have them do that. So you'll, if you were to watch a third mill video, you would see an Anglican talking on the same lesson as a Wesleyan, talking on the same lesson as a Baptist, like Al Muller up at um, Southern Seminary, your, your man, um, or like um, some of your Beeson people. Mark's been on here. Uh, Frank's been on our videos. Next to an African professor, next to an Arab uh, um, the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary in Beirut. We have them on our videos. Um, next to Wycliffe Hall, Oxford University on the videos, all on the same lesson. And that dynamic is extremely attractive to people because they get the sense and they're very threatened sometimes that this is going to be some ideological ploy that we're doing here. And we're really not trying to do an ideological ploy. We want to help. We don't want to make them like us. The last thing I want to do to anybody is to make them like me. I know what that is. I know what a nightmare that is. Okay, let them have their own nightmares. Say amen, somebody. Yeah, you want them to have your nightmare? No, thank you. It also needs, this curriculum also needs to be easily contextualized, which means you have to write it in a way that's sensitive to the fact that you have certain kinds of people writing it. Now, our dream is to, at one time, in the future to have courses originate outside the United States and back translate them into English. We've not done that yet. We're waiting for that opportunity. But, when, but we deal with the contextualization issue at about three different levels. The first level is this. Our, our coordinators of various languages review our scripts to make sure they're not too terribly Western, too terribly American. First step. Second step is that um, when they translate our materials, if they think that they need to switch things up a little bit, we have review and we are willing to do that for the sake of the cultural dimensions that they're focusing on. Um, the third thing is we encourage them and are developing, in fact, indigenous, what we call indigenous discussion forums, which are round table discussions by groups themselves, the people themselves, in their language, for their culture, talking about the lesson point by point by point. So, for example, Paul's prison epistles is one of our series. And um, the Mandarin discussion forum uh, they spent 20 minutes talking about whether or not a pastor had to go to prison before he could be ordained. Okay, now I don't care how cosmopolitan I think I am, that never came up. I never thought about that. Okay, but they did. Okay, so in their discussion forums, they are contextualizing it to their situation. And um, so we have those at least those three levels. There are a few others that we try to do as well, but those three levels. And in addition to that, if I could just put it this way, um, let's say when we're dealing with groups, say, like in Cuba, we encourage them to make video commentary. So if you have a school, we say, here's what you can do, especially if you use the Moodle system. You make little five-minute, ten-minute, three-minute commentary on the lesson where you want to disagree with it or you want to enhance something or you want to follow a particular subject. You do that, and it can be stuck inside of the Moodle system so that those that use it will have to do it. They'll have to look at it in order to proceed further. Does that make sense? And that also lowers the level of, of uh, threat, as it were, and it also enhances it. Let's just face it, because we, no matter how hard you try, you can't contextualize as much as often needs to be done. And I'll hurry through this. It needs to be easily enhanced. Let me encourage you this way. Curricula change. Okay, we estimate, in fact, right now we've actually experienced it because we're now in our 16th year, we estimate that the shelf life of one of these kinds of multimedia presentations is around 15 years. Because within that range, you're going, the technology has changed so much, the style of animations and things like that have changed so much, style of clothes on the interviewees, those kinds of things have changed so much, you're gonna to have to revise. So you have to create this in a way, from the beginning, that makes it easily enhanceable. Does that make sense? 
And so as you think about designing this, don't think about designing it just one level of delivery. You do that, you're cutting out the world. Don't think of it just one language. Don't think of it as just uh, aiming toward um, one, what was that? One, one denomination, one culture, one contextualization process, and nor one format. You've got to be ready to create something that can be easily manipulated into other formats. In my estimation, it also, these, these curricula also need to be iconographic. These are examples of the kinds of iconographic presentations that are in Third Mill. Remember, I said at an average hour, about 85% is this kind of stuff that you see up here. If we were in Arabic, it's all Arabic. It looks like it is Arabic. Um, if it's Russian, it looks Russian. If it's Spanish, it looks Spanish. And, um, and so the iconographic dimension, of course, as you can imagine, is very important because the average education According to, again, this is according to Ralph Winders, the average educational level of a pastor in the world today is seven years, which means you can't be heavily text-based. I mean, let's face it, even American students that graduate from universities can't read. Okay, so you have to learn how to read when you come to seminary, and you go, oh my gosh, I got to read this whole book? I never read a book that big my whole life. Yeah, you got to do that in three others. Well, try that in Uganda, okay? But you can do this. You can teach them the same things that you learn here. Believe it or not, you really can. You can teach it to them so that they can understand it, that they can get it a thousand times faster than you ever got it by reading by the iconographic approach. I can't tell you how many even American students have told me things like this. Uh, in, our, in our tradition, we re, in, in Paul, we reread re uh, Hermann Ritterboss. Paul, an outline of his theology, that's sort of a typical textbook for us. And there's a particular chapter on the Nair of Arctum, the imminent expectation uh, of Christ's return. And you can read that chapter a dozen times, you'll still not understand it. Okay? I can remember as a student reading it about five or six times going, I give up. Okay? You're still tested on it and you fail the test, but nevertheless, you spend a week trying to learn this one chapter in that one book, okay, of your precious time in seminary. Well, we have, you can put that in an animation and in 15, 45 seconds, they can get the whole chapter. It's done. That's the power of iconography. And then um, another characteristic that we believe in is the granularity. Granularity is extremely important because you are going to be dealing with different schools, different environments, different kinds of learning communities who need to mix and match this data in different ways. Uh, granularity is a, a very important aspect of multimedia educational material. Normally what we think is, you know, you give a lecture and if you don't finish a lecture, you just continue to the next hour, you continue to the next week, the next week, you have one lecture that takes you through the whole semester, basically. Well, when you do that, you have very little opportunity to mix and match the data the way schools will need it to be mixed and matched. They may have a school where they have a professor who can do, let's say, the prophets, but not somebody who can do um, the Pentateuch. They need to be able to chop this thing up. So granularity is extremely important as well in this kind of development of a curriculum. And finally, andro um, andragogically sound curricula are very important too. And by this we mean um, adult education. I don't know if you know this or not, but there are all kinds of books and material and data out there, research and the like, for adult education, andragogy, as opposed to pedagogy. Now the reality is, unless your school is very unusual, and I suspect it isn't, but if it is, great, praise the Lord. But unless you're very unusual here, you basically are being taught as adults like you teach children. Think about it. Now, if you don't know what that means, you need to take a look at some of the data on andragogy. And if you want to see this paper, this actually the talk I'm giving you here is a formal paper. You can look it up on our website and you can look at the footnotes and find out what andragogy is and that kind of thing. But some of the characteristics are, uh, andragogically sound educational materials need to be interactive. Uh, they need to be flexible. That is, you need to be able to do it at your speed, at your time, at your pace, and when you want to do it at 6 in the morning or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, here's the real critical piece. You must have immediate reinforcement for adult learners. That means, uh, for example, I'm helping my 14-year-old granddaughter learn geometry, Euclidean geometry, okay? And she says to me, when will I ever use this? And I just lie to her. And I say, don't worry, sweetheart, you're going to use it all your life. It's just a lie. Okay? It's just a flat-out lie. You're going to use this all the rest of your life. So she has to do it then, right? 
well, a seminary, I used to do that as a seminary professor too. When am I ever going to use the optative mood? The answer is never. But don't, no, 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 you're going to use it. You're going to use this Greek all the rest of your life. You're going to spend, you're going to get up on Monday morning and you're going to translate the chapter that you're going to preach on that week. Yeah, you'll do that the first week. In five years, you won't be able to recite the Hebrew alphabet. You might remember the song if they taught it to you by a song, but you won't be able to recite it. And if you can't recite the alphabet of English, how much English do you know? Okay, so andragogy requires immediate reinforcement. So like if you're teaching in Africa or you're teaching in Malaysia, that kind of thing, then what most of these pastors with these seventh grade education uh, need is they need to go home with something from your learning community experience. They need to go home with something they can use that week. That week. And if you do that, they'll come back. If you tell them, don't worry, you'll, you'll use it one day, forget it. They're going to dump you for watching TBN instead. They can use Benny Hinn that Sunday. They can use Joel Osteen that Sunday. You with me on this? And if you want to reach them with the truth, you've got to give them the truth in a way that has immediate reinforcement to the manifold accessibility. Again, reading, visual, audio, those kinds of things, that's andragogically um, important. So whatever you do, don't do what we did in the West. We know the results of that. So scarcity of theological education is the number one issue that motivates me. And if we don't change radically, the scarcity problem is going to get worse not better. I'm done. We could go to quality, but we don't have time. What do you want to say? You haven't said much. I've been trying to get you to, but... Questions? Yes. You don't want to detail about what um, the people who work with you do, like what our options are. As we yeah, we have, we have um, 35, is it? 35 full-time employees in the office in Orlando, and about eight people outside the United States that do translation work outside the United States. Michael Briggs right here is our executive director. Michael runs the show. So Michael, what do they do in the office? What's the variety of occupations? Um, it is very interesting. For one thing, it's like a mini UN while we're there. Like you said, we do five languages in the office. And so we have folks from China, folks from the Europe speaking world, um, Latin America, and Ukrainians and all that as well. So it's quite, quite Lunchtime is quite aromatic in our, in our office. But, um, so we do have folks that are, that are well-trained in translation. But one of the neatest parts of the office that we have is an office that's probably a little darker than this, but probably about as big as this, where all of our um, graphic designers and video designers work. And what's neat about this group is that they have not only, some of them have, we have a couple of them with MDivs, but a lot of them are just highly skilled in uh, in, anima in, in animation, doing this kind of thing. We've got former, um, the guy who was the lead animator on Brother Bear, Mulan, all of this, you know, Disney animation left Orlando. And he didn't want to move out to Burbank. And I, I'm sure we pay him a, a very small percentage of what they were paying him at Disney, but he loves what he's doing for us. And a lot of the really creative uh, graphics that you see uh, in our videos are done by him. Um, we've got folks who are well trained uh, at some of the, the best art schools in the world and they have devoted their lives and have been called to come work at Third Mill and they do some really, really neat things. And so it's a nice combination of people who <coughs> have gotten the theological background but also folks who also have that, just that gift of, of art and animation. So it's a really eclectic group of people. So you've got the, the folks from outside the U.S., you've got the folks who are the artists in the office, and then we've got the business people. Um, and the folks that raise the money. So it's really a quite, a quite a group of folks. And we know which ones of those are the most important, right? The ones that raise the money. <laughs> <laughs> They're always real nice to them because they realize that's where the money, where the salary Then we have a staff of writers. <clears throat> we also have a staff of writers that do a great job, and that's generally, you know, when we've looked at folks, you know, coming out of seminary, folks that have more of the academic or writing bent, necessarily <clears throat> than going, uh, past, going to the pastoral ministry. Um, we you know, just hired someone recently from uh, Gordon Conwell who, um, it's hard to write the stuff that we write. You know, you can write papers like crazy and they would be magnificent. But as Richard will show you here in some of the, the videos, you're really writing a screenplay. So imagine taking 
um, systematic theology and writing a screenplay <laughs> for it. You know, you want to keep it interesting. You want to make it just like something you'd see on the History Channel. This is the so Apostles' this, Creed. So this takes like. a skill um, to do that. And uh, see, these are some of the things that our, our guys are drawing um, there in the office. So it's really a really an interesting niche that we're in. Um, but it's it's really it's it's a privilege to go there every day because you get I you know I'm on the road a lot raising money or in my office crunching numbers or whatever it might be and when I get discouraged I go out there it's one of the most uplifting places I've ever worked. You know, Michael's a former banker. I'm a former professor. I'm an Old Testament geek. Okay, I spent two years of my life in the basement of the Harvard Semitic Museum learning cuneiform, so that lets you know what I am. Okay. Which he forced me to go see. Like super geek. Okay. Um, but um, I think the reason God brought this motley crew together the way he did, people that are not experts in this, um, is to demonstrate it's he that's doing it. Yeah. Um, when I first started, this will be interesting to you, I was told don't do this. It's impossible. And this is what they said to me. They said, first, Richard, it's too expensive. And at the time, it would cost about um, six to $10,000 a minute to do this kind of stuff that you see here. It's cheaper now even in the studios, but at that point it would cost about a billion and a half dollars to make an MA program. So we had to break the devil's back on that. We had to figure out how to do it cheaper, okay? Second thing they said to us is, even if you, can, if you had the money to make it, you can't get the translators. Well, I kind of knew that was not true because I was out there, okay? So that, that part was okay. Third thing they said to me was, Richard, even if you can pay for it and you get the translators, you can't deliver it. Well, in 1997, when we began, 1998, VHS was what we're talking about, okay? So a, an MA program, a two-year program, meant a truckload of VHSs. Okay, right, of course, you couldn't deliver that. But we knew that's not where it was going to stay. So remember what I told you on one thumb drive, one 32-gig thumb drive? We delivered over a year of seminary curriculum, full video like you're seeing here, plus audio, plus study guides, plus the manuscripts of these videos on one thumb drive for 16 bucks. Then they said, even if you could get the money to pay for it, even if you could get it translated, even if you could deliver it, they said to me at the end of it, they said, they won't want it because it's American. Okay, well... I'll just give you some numbers, and these are not missionary numbers. These are true numbers I'm going to give you, okay? These are not preacher numbers. These are deacon numbers. That's the way we put it. Okay? Verified, okay? We know we're being used in how many countries, Michael? 191. 191 countries, including Vatican City. I don't know who they are, but they're using us. Okay, maybe the Pope's doing a little uh, evangelical theology. Who knows? Okay? Okay. Um, we know that we have how many users? This, we make a distinction between viewers and users. Okay, viewers are people that watch us on TV only. Users are people that use us in some kind of learning community, broadly defined. Okay, but they're they're making progress through the curriculum. And how many are they? This is just last year, mind you. And these are verified numbers I'm giving you now. Okay, or Michael's going to give you seven million um, noses that we can count. You know, and, and those are just the ones we can count. Right, Richard had high bar. For that's what that was. When we add in the video um, and viewers, broadcasters, folks that see our stuff on Sat7, any other, out, out in Mongolia, literally. Um, yeah, we're on national television in Mongolia, for example. We're the top number one show in Mongolia on Thursdays and Saturday nights. Yeah, at least, <laughs> at least, at least one quarter we were. Yeah. yeah. We don't know that. <laughs> the Nielsen ratings had us there. So it was about, seven, we about 75 million um, when you include the broadcasters throughout the world. Now that's the estimates that those companies give us. We don't believe those estimates, 75 million. So I say maybe one hundredth of that is true. So that's 750,000. If we've got 750,000 people watching us on average one hour a week out there in the world, do you know, do you know how long it takes for an average seminary in the United States to reach 750,000 students? 7,000 years. See, biblical education for the world requires a saturation model to support these distributed learning communities. That's the idea. You, see, and you understand what I mean when I say support the distributed learning communities? Does that make sense to you? Um, if I could put it this way, um, when, you think, when you think about how um, 
when you think about how we do seminary, this is the normal way we do seminary. Um, and, and so when we send our missionaries out to do seminary, this is what they do too. Um, there are at least three dimensions of theological or leadership development. One is content, the other is ministry skills, and the third would be personal spiritual development. Um, if you're in a typical seminary, I don't know Beeson well enough to know the answer to this, but if you're a typical seminary in the United States or in Western Europe, you know where the bulk of the attention is given in those three years, is to content. Okay, Get a little ministry skills, you get a homiletics course or two, where I taught, you got to teach four, you got to preach four times in lab your whole career, four times. How much, how much preaching skill can you develop with four attempts at it? We had one evangelism class, and it was the most hated class of all, because you had to actually share your faith with an unbeliever once. Can you believe that? There was not one single class on prayer required. Do you have a required class on prayer here? Okay, you're going to be ministers of prayer in the Word and you haven't had a class on prayer? Um, people in my tradition can go to seminary and graduate from seminary and be candidates for ministry and never have seen a person die. Not one. The same thing, they can go through all that process, be <clears throat> candidates for ministry, and never have led a person to Jesus. Now what we're trying to do is to offload the bulk of the content and the data requirement. Not all of it, but just the bulk of it. So that a school can form without having to have nine professors. Okay, So they can get the basic data from the third mill curriculum. They can add to it any way they want to. It's no big deal. And even disagree with it. We had an Assembly of God bishop come to our office and say, I've got to deal with all these Latinos now, um, and we're going to use third mill in Spanish, but let me ask you this. Can we disagree with you? I said, I sure hope you will. I sure hope an Assembly of God professor or teacher would disagree with the things that are on this video from time to time. Let's pray that that happens. Don't be like us, please. Okay. So the content, the bulk of the content we want to have done for them, it's just like a book, only it's readable. That's the difference. And uh, that then allows the learning community to focus on the so what's of ministry skills and of personal spiritual development of the student vis-a-vis -vis the curriculum. So when you're studying Genesis, you're talking about the ministry dimensions of Genesis and application of Genesis and the personal dimensions of Genesis. Or if you're doing, um, I'm Old Testament, so you see where I am, Doctrine of Christ. If you're talking about the ministry skills related to Doctrine of Christ and the personal development of the student related to the Doctrine of Christ. That's what the living, breathing community is for, not for data transfer. Don't you want to scream bloody murder and say this is from the devil? <laughs> you know, we've got several of our students, or a number of our students, that really are expressed interest in theological education abroad. Um, you know, they're thinking, I'll go on, maybe do my PhD, or maybe not, but I uh, want to teach abroad. What, what do you want to tell those students? I want to tell them, please do it, because we don't need you here. The PhDs are a dime a dozen here. Okay, You have to be a Frank Thielman to get a job. You know what that means? Like megawatt brain. Okay, Now, if you're a megawatt brain, okay, go ahead and do it. But if, you, but if you're above average, you know, you're, you're going to get into a PhD program, but it's not going to be Harvard, it's not going to be Yale. If that's where you are, then there are tons of opportunities out there, just endless opportunities for training theologically around the world. Endless opportunities. And they need you so badly. What's the best way to look for those opportunities? Um, through your denomination, probably, unless you want to switch teams. What, where, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta have a church, man. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm not a nomination. But you have a local church somewhere? Yeah. Where? Uh, Oklahoma? Huh? In Oklahoma? No, here. <laughs> oh, I mean, well, you got Oklahoma yeah, on your jacket. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, non denominational churches usually have connections to mission boards and things like that. And they're out there. Or you can switch teams. 
<laughs> um, but they're out there. You know, do you have any contacts with foreign missions at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, she talked with individuals. But I was just wondering if you had a broad. Like, no, no. It's I think the main way is through some kind of denominational um, organization or through some kind of missionary organization. Campus Crusade has opportunities like this. The Graduate School of, of uh, Theology in Ethiopia is a Campus Crusade uh, item. Uh, the one in the Philippines is a Campus Crusade item. Okay, whatever that's called. I forget what it's called now. And it's, those are great schools, too, because they're very creative in the way they do things. They need to get in the media, but um, you know, they object. But no, it's all right. I love them. They're fine. Um, they'll change eventually. You know what will change theological education, don't you? The only thing that changes a church. What is it? You think it's the Holy Spirit? Forget it. What do you think? <laughs> money. Because we have this assumption that so long as money is flowing, then we're obviously doing what God wants us to do. Now, when you don't make budget, then all of a sudden you start thinking, well, maybe God wants us to do something different. Well, don't buy into that paradigm, okay? Get out there and do something different because you think God wants something done differently because it needs to be done. So if you were to go, for example, um, have you been anywhere outside the country? Yeah. Where? In Honduras. And okay, Hon all right, Honduras is a great example. We are, in, we are in Honduras, in a school. I haven't been there, but I've been told they have about 200 students, and here's what they're doing, is they're using us, they're using us for their first year. It's a three-year program, very traditional, but they're using us for their first year so that they can um, concentrate their faculty, which is very limited in numbers, concentrate on the so what's. Okay, so they just they don't see this as a threat. They see this as a gift because students and and another thing that often comes up in a place like Honduras is guys can't afford to come to seminary. So what they need to do is spend a lot of time out there. So you've got to have somebody to hand them. And a lot of those guys can't read very well. I hate to say it. I know it's a caricature, but it's a stereotype, but it's still true. Um, they just can't read very well. And but they can get into this stuff. Dude, I mean, there are people in the mountains of Peru. They can barely read any Spanish at all. But they can hear the Spanish, and they can look at it on a screen, and they can get it. It's unbelievable how powerful that is. Because they're watching Spanish television all the time. They're watching Spanish movies all the time. But hand them, hand them a systematic theology, hand them Grudem in Spanish, and they're going to look at that thing and go, what? Are you insane? For one thing, I can't even afford that book. So one of the gifts that God has given us right now, this is really great. This is the way the Lord works now. You know, publishers want money, right? They want to publish books and make money out of them. There's lots of money in the in theological books. But one of the great things is that Third Mill now has enough of a reach, enough of a constituency out there, that we're able to go to publishers now and say this to them. If you will give us these five books for free to put on the web for our students, then we will put a link to your website, and they'll buy other books from you. Okay, and they do it. They give us books. It's crazy, unbelievable, but true. Yeah. It's about the time I reserve the right for the last question. Um, <laughs> before, before you ask me, okay. hey, you come see me at the missions office. God wants you out there. He wants you more than you want to be out there, and I can help you find where he wants you. Now, Tom Keeley, Tom Keeley can do it, man. He knows he everybody. Can. He's the most networked. That dude person. knows everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And money's not an object. There's plenty of money for doing this. If you're willing to go, there's plenty of money. That's the last thought. That's right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so one of the things that, um, that I would see that you might come into uh, uh, some issues with overseas is many of the churches and denominations care just as much about accreditation, about the degrees from formal seminaries as, as we do, you and African and Asia. So how, how do you deal with that as you... Uh, <laughs> well, I was asked to speak to ATA, which is the like the ATS of Asia, and um, I, don't, I don't know if I should tell that story or not. Yes. Well, no, we do have. I can. It was a public meeting. It was a right. public meeting. Excellent. Okay, well, I can. Talk about the structure of the curriculum. Too. Okay, well, one. We are, we, it is one o'clock. All right. So, just All right, so very quickly, um, everything we do is accreditable ATS. It is not accredited ATS, but it matches all the standards of ATS. Okay, so if a school that's accredited by ATS adopts us, they can do that freely, because it meets all the requirements of the credentialing of the teachers, the contact hours, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that that's the first thing. Okay. Um, so all all you have to have is a school that's willing to step out and say we want a a distance education program 
and it can be theirs, lock, stock, and barrel. Um, but you need to know that accreditation is something that's going down the tubes very quickly, and that's from ATS itself. ATS itself will tell you that in 10 to 15 years, ATS probably is not going to exist, and let me tell you why. It's because, as, they, as the president of ATS said in a public meeting, every evangelical school and the, pardon me, every evangelical church and denomination that wants their students to go to an ATS seminary is flatlined or dying. And every Christian association, evangelical association, the denomination that's growing in the United States of America today doesn't want their kids to go to an ATS seminary. They want to train them themselves in their own churches. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate being. This might be a good time since this is on, on video for me to say that not all the opinions expressed by Third Millennium <laughs> <laughs> represent the Global Center of yeah. Peace and Divinity School. That's you right. Very much needed to hear this, and I really appreciate him being here. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You're the man. <laughs>